Hey everyone, in this video lesson, we are diving into electric fields, our first real lesson in the non-mechanical side of physics. So we're going to be taking everything that we've already learned about forces and energy and fields and start to apply those ideas down now to the sub-microscopic level and see how things are similar and how things are different. So just to remind us where we've been and where we're going. Previously, when we talked about fields, we were talking about gravitational fields. And we said that gravitational fields are created automatically by objects with mass. Anything with mass has its own gravitational field, which is able to exert a force at a distance on other objects with mass. So as other objects then interact with that field, they'll feel this attractive force pulling them toward the source of that gravitational field. All right. Now, similarly, down now at the, the submicroscopic level, we also see that electric fields are automatically generated around any sort of electrically charged object or electrically charged particle. All right. So similarly, we're casting out this invisible net that's able to exert forces at a distance on other electrically charged objects that are existing in that field. So let's go into a little bit more about what charge is and how we talk about it here in physics. So first of all, as we get more into the mathematical side of things, start looking at equations, we'll see that charge is represented by the variable Q. So you see Q, that means charge, right? And our unit of charge, this is a new unit for us, it's called a Coulomb, which I think is darling, all right? So we measure charge in Coulombs. Now, if you took chemistry previously, or maybe this shows up in biology as well, you may have uh, measured charge in terms of number of protons or number of electrons. But now that we're dealing with things at a slightly larger scale, we're looking at many, many electrons or many, many protons, um, it's helpful then for us to, to have a different unit of measurement, the Coulomb. Now, just to kind of place that in perspective for you, comparing it to number of protons or number of electrons. A single electron has a charge of negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, okay? Which if we didn't have uh, scientific notation for this would be a decimal point, 18 zeros and then a one six, okay? So we're talking about like each electron has a teeny, teeny, teeny fraction of a coulomb, just to give you a sense of scale in terms of how big a coulomb of charge actually is. Now, if electrons have a charge of negative 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs, any guess how much charge a proton has? That's right, positive 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So electrons and protons have the same amount of charge, same number of coulombs, just electrons are negative and protons are positive. Now, one other thing I want to mention is that charge is always conserved, much the same way that mass is always conserved, energy is always conserved. It can move around, it can um, attach itself to different objects, do different things, um, but that charge is always there. We are not in the business of creating or destroying charge um, as we're going through our daily lives. Okay, so we can move it, we can, can shift it to a different location, but we cannot get rid of it altogether or create it out of nothing, All right? So then, as we're talking about these electric fields, then you, you saw in your investigation a model of what those electric fields by convention look like. And so you saw something like this. If we've got a positive source charge, okay, so a positively charged object that is generating this field, um, our field looks like a bunch of arrows pointing radially away from our positive source charge, okay? Whereas if we have a negative source charge, as we see over on the right there, then our arrows are pointing inward, all right? But the significance and the meaning of these fields is a little bit trickier than it was with gravitation because with gravitation there's really only one type of mass right so all objects with mass are going to be affected by gravitational fields in the same way they're all going to be attracted towards the source of that field but with electricity we've got different types of charge which are affected in different ways by electric fields because we know opposites attract and like charges repel. So it would be impossible for us to, to capture in a single drawing 
all the effects that an electric field could have because it just depends on what combination of charges we have, okay? So by convention, when we draw in these field arrows, what we're indicating is the direction that a positive test charge will be pulled by this field, okay? So the field lines are really giving us a, a picture of what's gonna happen to a positive charge. Um, and then we just know that the negative charge is going to do the opposite. I just threw out this word test charge. I've kind of been, been inserting this idea of source charge along the way as well. So let me just kind of dive into that a little bit more, clarify what we're talking about with these conventions on electric fields. All right. So since we're dealing with two different interacting charges, it can be helpful for us to think of them in two different categories. We've got our source charge which is whatever charge is creating the electric field, okay? It's sort of like the center of the story here. And then the test charge is the second charge that enters the scene and is affected by that electric field, okay? So just kind of a way for us to sort of keep track of like, if we've got two charges, which one are we talking about at any given time? So the source charge is the thing that's creating the field. The test charge is the thing that is entering the field and being affected by. Okay, so then just to kind of clarify on those conventions of this is what happens to a positive test charge. Um, here we've got two different electric fields being generated by two different source charges. So on the left, we see the field generated by a positive source charge. On the right, we see the field generated by a negative source charge. Okay, points away from the positive source charge, field lines point in towards the negative source charge. Okay, now if we consider a positive test charge entering each of those fields. Okay, so these fields already exist and then doo -doo 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 -doo, a little proton like wanders into the field. What is gonna do in each of these situations? How is the test charge going to be um, interacting with the positive source charge? It's gonna be repelled by it because we know like charges repel, um, whereas our positive uh, test charge will be attracted to our negative source charge, all right? So in other words, this is what's going to happen to our uh, to our test charges in each of these situations. So for the field on the left, that interaction, we see that, um, that our test charge is moving away from the source charge because they're repelling. In the case on the right, we see that the test charge is being drawn towards the source charge because opposite charges attract. Now, what I want you to notice is that in each of these cases, the test charge is moving in the same direction as those field lines, okay? So whichever direction the field is pointing, that's which way our positive test charge is also going. Now, if conversely, we imagine a negative test charge, so instead of a proton wandering into the field, an electron wanders into the field. What's it gonna do in this situation? Um, well, in the, the field on the left with the positive source charge, we know opposites attract. So our negative test charge is going to be drawn towards the positive source charge. Whereas in the field on the right, since we've got um, like charges for both our source and our test charge, they're gonna repel and the test charge is gonna move away from the source charge. So we would expect to see movement that looks something like this. Now notice for the negative test charge then, our charge is moving in the opposite direction of the field lines. The field lines point in towards the negative source charge, but the test charge is moving away. Um, the uh, field lines point away from the positive source charge, and yet the negative test charge is moving in toward the source charge, okay? So this is what we mean by um, the convention that, that field lines show the direction of force on a positive charge. If we think through all these different possibilities of different combinations of source and test charges, what we see is that positive test charges will always move in the same direction as our field lines, whereas negative test charges will always move in the opposite direction of those field lines. Just to clarify what those arrows actually are telling us and what they mean. Okay. Now, um, let's connect this back over to energy. Before we do that, let's just recap really quickly what we said before about gravitational fields and energy. Okay, so we know that gravitational fields store gravitational potential energy, that when we raise up an object and we're giving it gravitational potential energy, really what's happening is it's in a higher energy location within that gravitational field, okay? And if I were to let that object go, the object is gonna drop from an area of high gravitational potential energy to an area of lower gravitational potential energy. So from this then, given that objects fall toward 
Earth, you know, and, and towards objects rather than falling away from objects. Gravity is always attractive. Um, this tells us then that regions farther from the source of our field are regions with higher potential energy and regions closer to the source of our field are going to have less and lower potential energy. Okay, so that's nice and easy. The farther away you get from an object, the higher the potential energy that can be stored in that field, essentially. All right. Let's make that jump over now to thinking about electric fields and energy. Okay, now much in the same way as with gravitational fields, electric fields now store what's called electric potential energy. Same kind of idea, the stored up energy that gives charged objects um, the, the potential to move, essentially. It's that stored energy that can be converted into motion. Now, just the same way as we saw with gravitation, charged objects will automatically, naturally tend to move from areas of high electric potential energy to low electric potential energy. We're all lazy, we go to the lower energy areas. Okay, and so that's true for gravitation, and it's true for for charges and electricity. Okay, um, but unfortunately, it doesn't end up being quite as simple because once again, we're running into the issue that electric force can be either attractive or repulsive. We have different combinations of charges that respond differently to that electric field. So we can no longer just make the blanket statement that farther away has more energy and closer in has less energy. It depends on our combination of charges, all right? So let's start by considering um, scenarios in which we have opposite charges, that our source charge and our test charge um, are oppositely charged from each other. Now, we know that opposites tend to attract, so they're going to naturally tend to move toward the source charge. Our test charge will naturally move towards the source charge, which means then that if they naturally move toward the source charge, and we know that they move from high potential energy to low potential energy, because again, everything is lazy, everything naturally goes towards the lower energy position, what this means is that in these scenarios, when we've got, um, got test charges that are opposite our source charges, we have higher potential energy the farther away we get from our source charge, and then as those test charges move closer to the source, they're going to have less potential energy. Okay, so that's just like with gravitation. That's nice and easy. Okay, so if we've got opposite charges, it's the exact same relationship between distance and energy that we saw in gravitation. But if we have situations where our charges are similar to each other, if we've got a positive test charge um, in the field of a positive source charge, or a negative test charge in the field of a negative source charge, we know that like charges tend to repel. So they're going to tend to move in, in the opposite direction, away from the source charge. Now, the rule that charges move from high potential energy to low potential energy still holds true. So the only way that that can be possible is if the direction of high to low energy flips for these parents, okay? So since our like charges tend to move away from each other and our charges are, by definition, moving from high to low potential energy, what this means is that we're now flipping the script and now the closer our charges get to the source charge, um, the higher the electric potential energy they have and the farther away they move, the less electric potential energy they have. So it's a little bit funny that, that the amount of energy that's stored up in the field depends on what type of charge you are, are looking at and what type of charge is present in that field. Um, so just a little, little head scratcher for you right there. See, things are getting weird already down at the submicroscopic level. It's great. All right. So let's now get into the idea of electric force. Now that we've broken our brains a little bit with the idea of electric fields, let's dive into force. We've talked about that for a while. Hopefully that's going to feel okay. All right. Now, um, we've established in our investigation that electric force varies with two main factors. It varies with charge and it varies with distance. What relationship did you find between charge and electric force? Hopefully what you found is that there was a linear relationship between electric force and charge, which means that if we double the amount of charge of our source charge or our test charge, um, then our electric force is going to double as well. If we triple the amount of charge, triple the number of coulombs, um, then we are tripling the electric force as well, etc. 
All right. What about the relationship between distance and electric force? What pattern did you find there? Aha, there's that inverse square relationship again. So once again, we see an inverse square pattern relating electric force and distance, which means that if we were to double the distance between two charged objects, the electric force would multiply by 1 over 2 squared, or in other words, our electric force would drop to one-fourth of what it used to be. If we triple the distance, our electric force drops down to one-ninth of what it used to be because it's one over three squared, all right? So let's see if we can put all of this together, this linear relationship with charge, this inverse square relationship with distance, and see if we can figure out um, a nice little equation to, to kind of put all of this together. Now, as a reminder, where we've been before, uh, when we talked about gravitational force, we had this equation that we sort of um, stumbled upon through our investigation there. We saw this relationship. Um, and so given that we're seeing some similarities between gravitation and electric force, I would love to ask, um, take a moment to think about, based on this, like, what do you, what do you think electric force is going to look like in terms of its equation? What, what might that equation look like? Do you think it's going to look really similar to the gravitational force equation? Ah, you're right. Look how similar that is. Oh, my gosh. All right. So electric force is equal to K, Q1, Q2, all multiplied together, divided by R squared. So a lot of similarities, but there are a couple key um, substitutions that we're making in here as we're talking about electric force. First is we no longer have big G, that universal gravitational constant. What we now instead have in its place is K, Coulomb's constant, which is equal to 9 times 10 to the 9th Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared. Just as we saw before with big G, this constant is constant. It doesn't change. You're always going to use that same number of 9 times 10 to the 9th any time you engage in this calculation, all right? So that never changes. You always have that extra multi multiplicative factor in there, all right? Our other swap is that now we have Q, which as a reminder, represents charge. So this means that to calculate the electric force acting between two charged objects, we multiply Coulomb's constant times the charge of the first object times the charge of the second object divided by the distance between them squared. And this is what like just blows my mind. Like, look, look at those two equations. They are so similar, even though they talk about totally different things. The one on the left, the gravitational force, that's the force that, like, holds the Earth in orbit around the sun. We're talking about gigantic things here. Whereas the electric force equation, ah, we're talking about, like, protons and electrons interacting with each other. And yet those equations look so similar. It's wild. It is wild. Like, I would not think of gravitation and electricity being virtually anything alike, and yet they are so gosh darn similar. So, hey, this is very exciting for me. All right. So taking a moment to really appreciate the similarities and and um, the, the analogies between these, I want us to take a moment to then really look at what are the things that play analogous roles uh, for these two forces, okay? So mass in gravitation is analogous to what in electricity? I look at the role that mass is playing in gravitation. That looks like the same as the role that charge plays in electricity. They both have those linear relationships with their respective forces. Big G in gravitation is analogous to K, Coulomb's constant in electric force. Um, but then both of these forces have the same effect or, or receive the same effect from distance. They both have that inverse square relationship with distance. Even though one's dealing with like teeny subatomic particles and one's dealing with like freaking planets and stars. It's crazy. All right. Last thing is just to walk through a uh, sample problem with uh, that new equation for electric force. Okay, so we've got one charge of 2.5 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs and another charge of negative 1.5 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. And they are located half a meter apart from each other. We want to figure out how big is that electric force they're exerting on each other and um, what type of force is that. So we're going to go through our guess method. We start by listing out all the information that we know. We know Q1. We know Q2 because we know both of those charges. We know the distance between them, which is represented by R. And of course, we know Coulomb's constant because we always know Coulomb's constant because it's always the same. So we are ready to plug and chug through this thing. So we'll go ahead and plug everything into that equation for electric force doing 9 times 10 to the 9th. 
times 2.5 times 10 to the negative 6 times negative 1.5 times 10 to the negative 6 and then divide that by 0.5 squared. I'm just going to throw that in my calculator and let it figure all of this stuff out. And when I do, I get a force of negative 0.135 newtons. Now, the significance of that negative is that it tells us that the electric force is attractive. Because for us to get a negative number, we would have to have one positively charged and one negatively charged object, which means that they're going to be, be attracted to each other because opposites attract. If we were to calculate a positive force, that would mean we either have two positive charges or two negative charges. Either way, that's going to be a repulsive force because like charges repel. So that's kind of what that negative is really telling us there, just that it's attractive. All right, that is everything that I've got for you right now. Hope that clarifies, hope that helps you look at the world a little bit differently to think about like how incredibly similar gravity and electricity actually are. It's wild. Thanks so much for tuning in with me.